Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to the Lather Talk podcast. You might know our guest this week from his work in restoring vintage razors or from his YouTube channel. Our guest for this week is none other than Matt Pisarsik of the Razor Emporium and Rec Supply Company. We'll talk about the beginning of his journey into wet shaving, what razors are set to be released from Rec Supply, and much more. Also, just a heads up that Matt was joining us from a local pub, so you may hear some additional background noise in the audio this week. We do apologize for that, but we're sure you're going to be interested in our conversation with Matt. And now, on to the episode. Hey guys, welcome back to Lather Talk. I'm your host, John, a.k.a. Lather Hog, and with me as always is my co-host, Gerard. Hey, Gerard. Hey, what's up, everybody? And for our guest today, we'd like to say welcome and hello to Matt Pisarsik from Razor Emporium and Rex Supply Company. Hey, Matt, how's it going? Hey, everyone. Hey, John. Hey, Gerard. Nice to see you guys. Thanks for having me. We're so glad to have you on. Uh, I know uh, I've been talking to Matt for a while. We try to schedule, get a, uh, you know, land on a date together that worked for both of us. Time zones, family, and all that stuff just kind of got in the way. But uh, we finally made it happen. We're, t- we're so happy to talk to you tonight. And yeah, so welcome to Lather Talk. I'm happy to be here. I am coming to you from a local um, <laughs> sports grill bar because I'm sure a lot of guys out there are fathers like me, like John, and it's really hard around this time, you know, um, your wife looks to you and wants you to help with bedtime routine, showers, PJs, you know, dinner time, and to get away right now, it only could be you guys to get me away from all that right now. (laughs) Well, we're happy to help however we can. (laughs) Yeah, I'm drinking the the biggest beer they had. They said, we we can't serve you a pitcher, but we can give you a giant mug. I said, yes, a giant mug. (laughs) <laughs> it will be it would be needed well you know i'm six foot eight i'm a big guy and i mean this to me looks like a normal size beer honestly <laughs> i i did not really know you six were foot eight? yeah i didn't know you're six yeah. foot eight so that, that that glass is even bigger than in real life well it's funny because all those you know we did that show i'd rather be shaving with douglas um smite from phoenix artisan and uh, he on purpose i kind of always look at how i sat in that show i always kind of like scrunched down a little bit to kind of look more close to him because if i stood up really tall i would basically kind of make him look like um danny novito you know in uh in shorty or whatever yeah. um twins that maybe movie was. was it twins, twins, with Arnold twins. yeah it was yeah with with um, arnold yes i mean douglas is a great guy but he is I, he says he's at average height at five, six, or five, seven, whatever he is. <laughs> well, you have a whole foot on him. That's yeah. You, you know what? You're you're right. I mean, I'm so I'm actually a big fan of I'd rather be shaving. And I mean, as, as far as like in my memory, the the, the the discrepancy like you were taller, but it didn't seem like like that by that much. So yeah, may, maybe you kind video of video just... editing perspective. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. all, the, all Matt, my height tell is you... my legs. He sat three feet behind Douglas. I know. <laughs> right, right. Perspective. <laughs> it, they did the whole like Lord of the Rings kind of. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> that's great. Well, uh, Matt, I mean, I think it'd be great to hear kind of, uh, you've been in wet shaving for so long and I, you know, I'm not sure at what point you went from just being a wet shaver to you know, uh, becoming a, uh, you know, rest- uh, getting into restoration and then, you know, starting a business yourself. So uh, is there like a, like a bird's eye view or, you know, kind of like uh, a top level, like kind of summary of the journey that you could, you could share with us? I'll, I'll try to give you the elevator story, but we'll, we'll assume the elevator is to the top of Sears Tower. So it'll be a couple sure. minutes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the day, uh, the year is 2005. <laughs> I'm a normal guy. Um, I am shaving with the Mach 3, and I'm getting really bad irritation, especially on my neck. I looked to my brother, who I was living with at the time we were both in college, and he's using a Mach 3. He's fine. He doesn't, doesn't matter to him. So I looked at my dad. He's using an electric razor. doesn't matter to him. So I'm like, what's going on here? So I get on, on the uh, interwebs, and um, 
I, you know, type in like sensitive skin, you know, like razor irritation, all these buzzwords everyone types in. And I, I, I found some article that said that a double edged razor would be a surefire way to get rid of irritation. Well, again, I'm in college at ASU, go Sun Devils. And um, <clears throat> I don't have a whole lot of cash, you know, uh, I'm a working student and you know, money's tight. And so I, I read basically, you can find an old double edged razor at an antique store. And so I went out, I'd never been into antiques before, never been into anything old and vintage before. And then I went to an antique store and I walked in and I said, do you have a double edged razor here? And the guy was really nice. He said, actually, we have a bunch. And no joke, again, this is 2005. Mm -hmm. uh, he brought me back to a display case. And in the display case were a red tip, a slim, a fat boy, an aristocrat, a big fellow, a super speed, and uh, something else, maybe. But at least five or six, like, classic double-edged Gillette razors. And for the price of buying one Mercur razor, on the only place at the time to buy a razor, which was classicshaving.com. There was no Amazon people. There was nowhere else to buy a double-edged razor. I said, you know what? I could either buy from Classic Shaving for 50 or $60 plus shipping, or I could buy all these razors here for 50 or $60. And I had even more. Well, that, that's how it started. I've got all these vintage razors. I had no idea what I was looking at. I went home and I tried to clean them up and sanitize them and get them safe. And I learned a lot about metal finishing and restoration immediately because I've screwed up a bunch of them. And um, uh, that's kind of how my journey began. Uh, fast forward the tape, I, st I kind of got bit by this bug. You know, I have a degree in business marketing. I really, really liked, as I was researching, seeing these old Gillette advertisements, these old Gillette commercials. And um, I started collecting more. And I was like, well, you know, I already have two super speeds. What if I sell one of those? And I can finance buying this other thing, you know, the single ring old type or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of how it started with buying and selling and flipping uh, to finance my hobby. And I thought, well, if I'm not putting any more money into it, if I'm just flipping, you know, what am I to lose? And that's kind of how it started. And before you know it, I had like a shoebox full of, of collectible razors and I was using them and I started noticing the irritation problem went away. I really liked it. Um, and I was using chat rooms at eBay and other places at the time to sell my duplicates off. Um, but needless to say, those places became uh, hard to, to hard to consistently sell on. There's all sorts of roadblocks and yellow mm -hmm. tape to, uh, to have to sell on other places. So I said, you know what? I'm going to code my own website. I'm going to learn to code. Wow. <laughs> and I actually did. <laughs> I, coded, I coded my first website. It used a platform called uh, Zencart. It was super sketchy, did not have really good security, um, but it worked. And I remember I put the website live. Um, I bought the domain Razor Emporium, mostly because there was a store I used to shop at with my mom when I was a kid called Drug Emporium. Mm -hmm. and I always like the name Emporium. So I thought, okay, I'm selling Razors, Razor Emporium. I bought the domain on GoDaddy and I put this website up. And I remember like three months later, like nothing happened. Crickets for three or four months. And all of a sudden, you know, I got this email. And it said sales zero 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 one, and it was for you know, like a fat boy, I think. And I was like, wow, this is really cool. Someone just gave me money for this razor, you know. And that was the beginning of it. Now we're up to order fifty six thousand or something, um, you know. Uh, so that was two thousand five. I think the website went live in two thousand nine. Okay. Uh, we had our first sale in two thousand ten. Uh, we incorporated it as an LLC, and uh, the rest is kind of history. Just kind of kept on going at it, and originally like like just like the razors I, I started to sell on razors only but then people started to ask me oh can i get blades so i had to find where to buy double edged blades at wholesale price and then people started to ask me oh can i get some shaving soap from you so i had to like write an email to parasso and ask for a uh, wholesale account from parasso okay it just kind of slowly started organically one thing after another after another um and then like you know, the video stuff started mostly because I got tired of answering the same email again and again and again. So I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to make a video. That way, if someone has this question, I can just send them the video link mm -hmm. and it answers the question for them. That's really taken off. And now today we have like almost 30,000 subscribers on our channel, almost 3 million views. And it's probably our primary place where people hear about us is on YouTube. Um, I think we have a close to 300 videos on our channel. Wow. Um, so, yeah, it's just been a progressive journey at the time you know after college I, I graduated with my business degree 
I got a job at a local hospital in marketing. That's my field. I did that for like five years and I was doing this kind of, you know, after hours. I remember telling all my friends at work that I had this like weird little website where I sold shaving stuff <laughs> and everyone's like, this is really weird. But the hospital ended up getting bought out by a bigger company in town. And when they merged, they said, we already have somebody in a marketing position like you. So we're going to let you go. And I had to make a really tough decision. Do I update my resume and go out and try to interview again? Or do I just try to make this happen? And I was like, you know what? F it. <laughs> I'm going to make this happen. And that, that was that was kind of becoming self-employed. And that was in 2013. And here we are. It's 2021. So never looking back. Wow. That's quite the journey. <laughs> I, and actually, um, so uh, I, this might be a you know, t- totally separate tangent, but where does uh, Rex Supply fit into that story? Well... You know, there was another company. Um, okay, so I founded the business with a, with a really good friend of mine. He was actually the drummer for my old band. I was a guitar player. He was a drummer. Oh, all and, right. And we would, we would go antiquing together. And he he was, you know, he founded Razor and Pouring with me. And um, along the way, we, we said, you know what? This is so cool, restoring other people's old razors like Gillette or Mercur or whoever, Chick. But what if we made our own razor? And that was probably around like 2012, 2013. We're like, let's make our own razor. So we started a second company together called Bison Made, which today is called Ezra Arthur, um, if you've ever heard of them. Well, we got super into leather goods because we're like, okay, well, we need to have a nice leather case for this razor. And so we started making all these leather products, wallets and straps and phone cases well, him and I kind of had a, a disagreement and it kind of just, you know, exploded and we decided to split ways and he took Bison Made and he ended up shortly thereafter having to change the name to Esmark because of a trademark issue. Um, and then I took Razor Emporium and I never got my chance to make my own razor and I was really mad about that for years. And so I thought about it and I was like, you know what, I want another company. I want a manufacturing company. Mm. And I don't want it to be called Razor Emporium because I don't want it to be like the like the store brand where people like Maggard's Razors or West Coast don't want to sell it because they know me, they know me as Razor Emporium. They know I'm oh. their com- competition as a retailer. Let's make another brand where it can be into stores and I'm not going to be threatening them. And it's just for manufacturing only. So I came up with this name Rex, kind of a, a over actually over sushi with a friend. We we're sitting there drinking some sake bombers, eating some <laughs> rainbow rolls. And um, we we're spitballing names. He's a good friend. He does copywriting for a living. Great guy. And um, he said, you know what? I, uh, I used to watch this detective show and the, the lead character was named Rex. I said, man, this is such a cool name. It like reminds me of the 50s. It's such a kind of a throwback name. And I, I, just, I just immediately gravitated to that name. I also kind of speak Spanish a little bit, at least enough. And I know that in different languages, Rex is really uh, easily transferable. Like, it, you know, the whole Latin you know, world and the romantic languages, French and everything, all know what Rex means. I was like, this is a name that no matter where in the world, people know it means king or means the best or whatever. And I, mm-hmm. I like that. I also like the tie-in with the, the King Gillette. You mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. the founder of Gillette was named King. And I wanted to be the best. So we came up with a tagline that it meant revisit excellence. And that's really what it was supposed to be. Like, let's, let's go back to when things were made really, really well. And that's kind of the inspiration for Rex. I think I founded Rex on paper in 2017, um, but we really didn't, or maybe 2016. We didn't come out with our first product, the Ambassador, until the end of 20, let's see, 2017. Yeah, that's right. Okay. The very end, we launched the, the Rex Ambassador in September of 2017. Um, and that was a razor I'd worked on for like three years. It was a long project. I originally had another partner with that, that, uh, that product. It was a really cool guy who made fountain pens. He was a nice guy. He actually came into my shop. I literally had this guy walk in and he said, I want to know, I want to meet the owner. And it was this Indian fellow, which is relevant because we were going to originally have it made in India. And he's like, I make fountain pens in India under the, you know, this name, and uh, I want to make a razor and I want you to help me. Well, we worked together for a couple of years trying to do it. And it just, there was always a delay after delay after delay. It never happened. 
And I finally told him, I said, you have a drop dead day of April of 2017 because I'm going to Big Shave in Pasadena and I want to bring it with me. You need to bring, you know, 50 of these razors, either we're going to do it or not. And I remember he pulled into my shop, you know, a couple of days before Big Shave and he brought something that was so substandard of quality. And I looked at him, I said, you really think I can put my name on this? This is, this is just crap. And I kind of basically fired him after that. I was like, I'm just doing this on my own. Well, that kind of actually started a whole crazy story that no one knows. I'll tell you, I'll, I'll make it a lather, uh, lather hog, lather shave, exclusive. <laughs> lather here. talk, lather talk, lather, exclusive. lather talk, exclusive. Sorry, we were we were, we were going to get there. <laughs> so he, this is April. He brings me this shitty prototype, and uh, and I was like, man, I'm supposed to show this at Big Shave. I told people to bring something really cool at Big Shave. And we basically polished it, made it look kind of like decent, but it wasn't really functional. And I still brought it and showed it, and we started taking pre-orders for it. But I then had to reverse engineer and find a machine shop here in the States between April and September. We ended up sending them out in September. In that short period of time, which took them three years beforehand to not do, I did in like five months or six months, and I got it out. And we, we, we sent in our first copy or, you know, first edition of the uh, ambassador. And that was kind of the, the beginning of Rex. Um, it started in such a weird fashion, but today we've sold like, I don't know, seven or 8,000 razors between the envoy and the ambassador. And, um, you know, it's, it's just exploding. It's now carried the, uh, the Rex line is now carried in 50 stores around the world. Um, you know, it, that was the whole vision I had was not just to be, a razor for my store was to be all over the world. I wanted to be known the world over, just like Gillette. So that, there's your rec story. <laughs> nice. Well, I mean, that, that really just nestled into that, um, the timeline of, of that story overall. Uh, one thing I have to know, though, is your band name. What, what, was, what was it? <laughs> the band's name was In Stereo. All right. Okay. I like it. In Stereo. In Stereo. All right. In stereo, I don't know why I like that name. Um, we played like progressive rock. Imagine if if um, Radiohead and Pink Floyd and U2 had a baby. That was that was us. <laughs> Maybe Pearl Jam too. I don't know. And it was fun. I, I, do you still get to play guitar every now and then? Are, are you still like noodling around at home? I, I play. Yeah, I noodle at home. I still have all my my gear. I never, it never gets played. My you know my you know rock and roll gear doesn't get played but you know i have a, a beautiful 1939 arch top gibson that i i do play a lot at home nice my, my kids get to hear it they like it that's good kids love music and um yeah. and, and to p- uh, pivot a little bit just given how long you know just from when you started wet shaving to starting you know two different companies businesses etc I'm really curious to know, like, what are some of like the biggest changes in the wet shaving space that you've seen? Maybe if if you need me limited, I can say maybe like pick two no, or three. Or I'll, but I'll, you know, I'll, 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 I'll give you two or three. The first <laughs> I already kind of mentioned. Yeah. Uh, availability. Number one, availability. Like I said before, there was one place to buy wet shaving stuff. It was ClassicShave.com out of California. That was it. There was nothing else. Shortly thereafter, there was West Coast Shaving. But, um, you know, now you can find wet shaving products everywhere. Other major thing that changed was, um, I, I would call it, if you like math, I call it uh, a fractal. You know, a fractal is where, you know, a shape keeps on just getting finer and finer detail and it just keeps on looking like the original shape. Well, um, think of like a tree, right? It's a big branch and mm-hmm. it goes out and still like a little branch. Even each leaf looks like a branch. Um, you know, back in the day, uh, there was basically Mercur or Edwin Jagger and maybe Parker, and that was really it. I still remember when the first stainless steel razor started to come out. In fact, I can, I can, my claim to fame was that Razor Emporium was the very first American retailer of Icon Razors, um, which is now kind of a, a, we- a weird brand you can see around. But Icon was like, kind of the big guy who came out with a stainless steel razor. Uh, he was making him in Thailand. Uh, his name's Greg Khan. I think they're still around. I think he sells exclusively through Maggards. But um, 
Um, also, Pills, if you guys know the German company, Pills Razors, we were the we were the first place in the United States to sell pills. But it was like a couple of these random little companies that started branching off and saying, no, we're going to make a, a higher quality razor. Um, I remember like uh, Weber, Weber razors kind of came around. Yeah. Uh, I remember Trade Array when it was, you know, around. All these little guys kind of popped up and they would make a razor or two and then they kind of go out of business or they would lose interest or whatever happened and then disappeared. Um, so I'd say number two would be the, the, the fractal nature of our industry. It's just splintered into a million different brands and companies. Everyone's trying to make a razor or soap. And then that's number three. I'll, I'll, I just brought it to you. Yeah. So <laughs> again, back in the day, it was like Taylorville Bond Street, Parasso. You know, I remember like one of the first Tabak. artisans, to, yeah, Tabak, was uh, Mama Bear's. Mama Bear's soap. Mm -hmm. you know, I was on Badger and Blade. Mm -hmm. And that was like, wow, I could have somebody make me a soap. Wow. You know, now everyone has a soap. Everyone's doing the artisan thing. Every artisan's putting out a million flavors every day. And um, that's like the thing now. So none of this was around. It was like, okay, I'm going to buy my Merker 34 HD and I'm going to shave with my Parasso Green with an Astra Blade. Like that was wet shaving in circa 2005. I would say it was also wet shaving in 2011 because that's pretty much my exact setup was. <laughs> Except instead of the HD, I had the, the thin handle, the 23C, the thin long handle, three piece. That was my so. first razor that I bought commercially. Mm -hmm. I bought it because it was cheaper on Amazon. <laughs> well, there wasn't an Amazon in 2005. Well, maybe there yes. was, but it was just for books. Right, right. Correct. That's true. Yeah, it's been about 15 years of being in this market, you know. Um, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, yeah, I mean, I, I can't imagine the amount of different brands, artisans, except even vendors that have come and gone in that time. Yes. Right? And, and the gone part is really important because, you know, again, I'm not trying to, like, brag or toot my own horn, but this is an interview with me. <laughs> but, you know, a lot of companies have gone. And I've, I've tried to do things a little bit differently. And uh, you know, some people really, they kind of, they, they, they do like a firework. They come on the market and they're like, bam! And they just instantly explode. They try to do way too much things. And I call it death by diversification. Um, to me, I'm more of like the, uh, you know, the, 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 what the, the, the tortoise and the hare. I'm more the tortoise who's going to keep on just, I'm never going to stop, but I'm not, I'm not going so fast. To me, I'm not worried if it's this year or next year um, because it's a long-term play. I told everyone my age earlier, I just turned 36 years old. I'm young. I, um, I, I know this market. I'm here to stay. I, this is my career now. Whether I release a new product this year or next year, to me, is more about timing of the market and making sure things are right rather than trying to just rush stuff because I'm you know, got dollar signs in my eyes. I'm like, you know, I want to do things right. Well, kind of moving forward and bringing us to the, the present day, Matt, uh, I, I'd be curious to know how has this past year, in particular the pandemic, how has that affected things for you uh, as far as the business goes? Good and bad. Um, Good because we're e-commerce and we saw uh, a huge increase in sales, especially in um, June and July of last year. Usually our, our summers are slow period. Our summer last year was like Christmas. It was crazy. Wow. Um, I think a lot of people were sitting at home and we sold more shaving kits than ever. Like people, I think like, oh, you know, I'm at home. I'm going to get into this blood shaving thing. So we sold a lot of straight razor beginner kids and safety razor beginning kids um i wouldn't say bad but definitely hard at the time last year uh, we were at a rental building and the rental building had other tenants in there and uh, the landlord basically decided to shut the building down for covid and we were basically forced with two options move out or uh, just be shut down and not have access to our workshop, which is not really viable. I'd be out of business. Um, luckily, in December of 2019, um, I bought a building that was a huge warehouse down by the uh, airport here in Arizona, Phoenix, 
And so I had this warehouse. I was kind of slowly renovating. I was like, oh, I'll, I'll go there eventually. It's like a life, you know, life wrap. I'll, if I ever need to go there, I'll go there. I really actually bought it just as an investment. But, um, you know, all of a sudden I basically was like, well, we're leaving this place and we're going to the new building. And my entire crew worked together. You know, we probably took 50 trips back and forth with cars and trailers and vehicles loaded up with supplies and machines and equipment. And uh, we moved our entire operation in a matter of like maybe a week or two. Wow. And then it took us another probably a month and a half, two months to really fully set up and become operational. Meanwhile, we were still accepting all sorts of service work. So we just had service work piling up. I think at one point we had like over 300 razors in our shop for service. And I was trying to build out the infrastructure. I don't think anyone understands like how much infrastructure is really needed to, to do the volume of work we do. Um, it's not like we're, you know, in our kitchen with a little tiny set of beakers, like plating little things. Um, you know, we have uh, all of our plating tanks are like, you know, 100 gallons of fluid and there's, you know, dozens of them to do a, a certain process. So it, it takes a lot of plumbing, a lot of electrical work, a lot of uh, infrastructure to really, you know, set up, not to mention all the polishing, dust collection, you know, I mean, just powder coat um station um heat treating we do we make straight razors right uh grinding you know um just there's so much in our shop i mean we have a we have a 7500 square foot warehouse and um just to give you an idea of volume of how much it takes to do what we do so it's not like it's moving you know a couple a couple machines or something Mm -hmm. so the pandemic was was both good and bad. It really kind of put us to our, our limits, but um, um, I'm, I'm happy to survive it. There were other people I knew, cause you know, I'm plugged into the local business scene here in Arizona and Phoenix. Um, there was a lot of people I knew who went out of business, mm. uh, woodworkers, metal workers, uh, fabrication shops, uh, machine shops. Um, so, you know what, I'm just fortunate that, that everything worked out for us and yeah it was hard but guess what that's what makes you strong well i'm glad yeah, I'm, I'm glad you guys were able to kind of weather that storm and i i, I mean I, I just can't imagine how fortunate it was to have that space to move into because it really you know it really does sound, that's like sink or swim time if your old space was just just gonna be shut down like until who knows when yeah yeah i mean it was a really cool place to be for a while the rent was super cheap, um, but it was like a – back in the day, it was like a jobs training uh, workshop kind of building where, let's say you wanted to become a construction worker, uh, you could go in there and get training on it. Or if you need to get your GED, they had like a classroom there. But then they also had like a, um, like a printing uh, – printing press room where if you wanted to learn how to use a printing press, they had all the equipment there or a wood shop room. And so we had like an old warehouse or an old workshop that was in the basement. And it was so, it was so random because anytime anyone came to see us, they came to this, you know, old decrepit building. It was a hundred year old warehouse in downtown Phoenix. And it looked so sketchy and uh, trying to get to find our, us was weird. And, um, it was right by the railroad tracks. People, I don't know. It was just—it was such a sketchy place. There was homeless people all around. So I kind of felt bad for my local customers. And I remember people saying, "Like God, this is where your business is." I'm like, "I'm sorry, this is where we're at right now." That, that's maybe one other thing I want to just mention, kind of in passing. That you know, it's like if you've ever started a business, I don't, you know, if if you haven't, it's really hard to comprehend. Like unless you want to get on Shark Tank or something, and like take a bunch of someone else's money you have to do every single thing out of sales and um you know if you want to generate revenue uh, let's say let's say you want to you know build out a space and it's going to cost you fifty thousand dollars to build out a space well how are you going to get that money you know you've got to now sell like a hundred or a hundred fifty thousand dollars product to pay for that fifty thousand dollars of profit um you know you can get you can try to get a loan Good luck. Go down to a bank and tell someone you want to start a business and it's in shaving and you're going to restore razors and watch them laugh at you. As you they're not going to give you a loan. Like, so it's a struggle. I'm not trying to like 
paint myself as a martyr, but um, doing anything in this industry is hard. You know, um, trying to grow a business from scratch is hard. Trying to grow and expand is hard. And that's, it's just an ongoing thing. And um, I, I just, I guess I want to say that no business has ever finished being built. It's always in progress. It's kind of like a website. The website's never done. It's like just in between updates. Mm. Um, your business is never finished. Like I have a vision for Razor Emporium that's so much bigger than what you see now and so much more involved. And uh, there's, there's products and services uh, that I'm working on behind the scenes that may not come to fruition for a year or two or three, but um, it's never over. It's always just in the middle of an update. <laughs> I think that that's a great, that's a great attitude to have. I mean, I think it's part of the reason why you have survived this long, if not, and not just, not just survived, right? I think that'd be underselling it. It's that you have thrived and flourished. So um, I, I really do appreciate kind of a little bit of that um, kind of you know, like the business insight. Cause I think there's plenty, given that, you know, like there's artists and soap makers, brush makers and and uh, as we were talking a little bit uh, off air before uh, people get into razor making right um, people might have creativity they might have artistry but that business component is it's not necessarily present for everyone sometimes we're lucky and like can partner with someone with that business sense but you know well and, and you you it's, it's actually interesting you brought that up because I want to touch upon that real quick that sure um, you know to be an artist and and I'm, again, I'm, I'm, I'm going to hope I'm going to come across non-judgmental, but it's more from my experience meeting these people. I've been to Maggard's meetup. I've been to meeting, meetups in New York. I've been to meetups, you know, in uh, in Florida, in, in Arizona, of course, um, Michigan. When you go to these meetups, and you meet an artist. Generally speaking, they're, they work for themselves. They maybe have one employee, maybe. They work out of their house. They don't need a commercial space. They can do everything they need in their kitchen. They have a home office where they can print, you know, shipping labels and print, you know, labels. They, they you know, they can buy their their supplies. If they're, let's say they're a brush maker. Well, they got their garage. They got their one or two machines in their garage. Um, that's all they really need. If they're a razor maker, well, unless they're, unless they're like car or like um, uh, Yates Precision or um, uh, razor rock they own their own machines most mm -hmm. of the people just contract out like even i we, i don't i don't own my own equipment for the milling and a lathing the cnc stuff no we contract out um so it actually doesn't take too much but the the stuff we do you know like i have a crew of eight people um that's a lot of mouths to feed that's a lot of um i i, I put bread on the table for eight other families uh, before I, I, I get to take any money out of the pie. Um, it takes that many people just to run our operation. Uh, we have to have a lot of equipment in-house for all the stuff we do. I can't, you know, years ago, we used to send out for plating and it became a logistical nightmare. And a lot of where some of my bad reputation came from was when I was polishing stuff in my garage and sending out to a, a plating facility off-site and they would lose pieces or it would take two months to send something back to me and I'm just I'm just the middleman now and it took a long time to get to a place where I had everything under my own my own house I would eventually like to bring the, the manufacturing the, the rec stuff in house we do a lot of it we do the finishing work we do all the uh, laser engraving we do all the assembly work we actually make our own packaging in-house too mm -hmm. so quite a lot is made in-house our soap making's in-house but I would love to eventually have everything under my roof. Uh, but it takes more time, more money. In fact, I just looked at a CNC mill yesterday. It's a twenty thousand dollar mill. Mm. That's a that's a that's a lot of money to chew off of uh, out of profit uh, to to put out for a machine, and I have to find someone to run it. So there's a lot. There's a lot of moving parts. Um, I'll tell you what. Out of all the things I do, making soap is the absolute easiest. Um, not to disparage anyone who makes soap. But to me, uh, making soap was literally child's play compared to all the other stuff we do. It took me about um, 30 days to get the equipment and the packaging and the labels, everything and the formulas figured out. It didn't take long. Um, again, not to try to discourage people, but to put things in perspective. Uh, I do respect the artisans out there, um, but I, I, I think there's, there's just kind of a, a different level 
And that's why I think there's only one razor room for him. Not because I'm smarter. I think I'm the only one stupid enough to, to stick with this. Uh, because it does take a lot. And it takes a lot of uh, beatdowns <laughs> to do this. Yep. Got to be uh, resilient, it certainly sounds like. Yes. And having a thick skin. But um, I want to kind of pivot a little bit uh, into our listener, it's our listener questions and kind of like community engagement portion um, for the episode. And um, one very straightforward um, one, uh, we have a question from uh, this is from Instagram, Hanging with JT. Uh, and he asks, How many razors do you have? in your personal collection? I have no idea. Um, <laughs> let's just Is say there's more than more. <laughs> we'll throw out a number and you just nod on I whether don't know. it's around I, I actually, there. I don't even know. I've never inventoried it. I can tell you though, I am like maybe two or three razors shy of owning every American Gillette razor ever made. <laughs> so so okay. which ones are you in the hunt for or are you like... uh let's see i'm trying to remember back uh, the biggest buy i just had recently and everyone talked about this on uh on those facebook groups i bought one of my holy grails i bought the original double ring uh litho tin box it was the very first box that the very first gillette razor ever was put into in 1903 1904 uh it was not even the razor it was a box. <laughs> okay. It was the box. It's, oh. it's a steel box that has lithography printing on it. Um, that has a gold looking razor on the front says Gillette. And it showed a double ring. I paid seventeen hundred dollars for a metal freaking box. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, but that was a holy grail. That was yeah. like in my top five list. I, I was left. I think I have like you know three or four left. Um, they're all going to get really expensive now. But I'm not I'm not actively collecting anymore. Meaning, I'm not out there like antiquing or looking at eBay. If stuff comes my way, and I see a good deal. Yeah, sure, I'll buy it if, I, if it's into my collection. But most things I buy to flip now. Like people hit me up all the time. Oh, I got a box full of super speeds and tech razors. I'm like, I okay, I've sold ten thousand of them. Not exaggerating. Um, maybe more. Sure, I'll buy them. Um, in terms of my personal collection, I don't know. Probably two or three hundred razors in my personal collection. Now, what's in my bag? I don't. Now, the thing is, I don't use any of those. I, I don't shave with any of them. People think that's crazy. In fact, at the moment, they're all packed away. Uh, I am part of my new building that I have is I'm going to be building an executive lounge eventually. Oh, it's going to be a, a second story level where it's going to be uh, a man a man cave. It's going to have mm. nice big couches. I like smoking cigars, so it'll be cigars, whiskey, and and uh, and I, I'll have I'll have the the display there. I used to have the display in my store, but um, I got really nervous. People would would sometimes go in there. I didn't have a lock on it, and some of those items in there are worth you know thousands of dollars each. I was like, you know, this is really dangerous. Yeah. And another thing is, it takes a valuable room. You know, as my as my store has grown. Like I need more just shelf space and, and floor space for the actual product I'm retailing and selling and having a giant display case full of razors that are not for sale is it's not, it's not, you know, not a, you know, possible, but I did bring out the, the collection for the big shave um, that we had here. It was local in Chandler in 2019, the big shave Southwest. Mm -hmm. I brought my collection to that. So a lot of people got to see it in person. Um, I always tell people in my bathroom, I don't have, I think I have like three or four razors in my bathroom. Right now, I think I have a British red tip. I have an Edwin Jagger with the laser cut handle that Neil Jagger personally gave me in a trade show we worked together. Oh, wow. Um, I got the new supply razor. That's my favorite razor. And we just picked up the supply, the injector. Uh, they're, they're actually on my website as of, I think, today. Um, so I've been using the supply for like a month now. I uh, love it. Um, I have, of course, an ambassador and an envoy. Um, I also have prototype razors that I'm, that I'm working on. There's two new Rex razors coming out soon. I have prototypes that I'm working, you know, and testing and, and using. Mm -hmm. um, DEs? Uh, yes. <laughs> okay. we, we, have, we have another 
I'll just I'll give you a quick little hint. We have another adjustable razor coming out. I'm not going to say anything more than that. It's okay. Adjustable DE, and then we have a non-adjustable DE. So we have one of each coming out. I actually getting the supply has made me want to make a single edge injector style uh, razor handle now because I I couldn't. I used injectors like very briefly, and I never liked them. But then the supply. Uh, really changed my mind of how they can feel. Mm. And I want to make an injector style razor now. But that's in my bathroom. I only have like a couple of razors. I, I'm, I'm kind of a creature of habit. If it works well, I just keep on using it. Yeah, that's, I think that's a nice variety that, that you have in, in the bathroom. I mean, I was going to, I was going to ask like what actually, you know, if the Bosa collection is boxed up, what actually makes it, you know, into the, into the rotation. So, so the number sounds... one thing would be the um, supply right now, the red tip, Evan Jagger, and um, occasionally I have number forty-three Icon. That was the forty-third one ever made. I have number forty-three. I get I use that occasionally. Nice. I don't know if this will be in it, but yeah, I bear like I'm kind of venturing, dipping my toes into vintages. So I have a very like less than probably 15 vintages and stuff like that. So it's been, yeah, to hear like 300, I'm like, nope, not, not going to go for it. Not, not well, even. I'll tell you this. The other thing, you know, you guys are, you asked me earlier, what's changed with the market? There would be no circumstance in which today I could build a collection I have. It wouldn't be possible. Mm. I'm not just saying this to like brag, but like, Back in the day, in 2005, 2007, 2008, if you went into an antique store anywhere in the United States, at least anywhere I went, you'd walk in and there was a chance you would find, I wouldn't say a chance, it was more than likely you would find good selection of vintage Gillette razors. And sometimes with the cases, you know, fat boys were like an everyday thing to find, a fat boy. I remember going up to antique store owners back when I antiqued a lot. And I would say, you got any, you know, old razors? And they would say, yeah, I got a shoe box full. I can't sell these things. You want these? Five bucks each, you know, like nothing. And um, the market today has completely changed. Obviously there's a lot more people out there looking for razors and they've driven the price up. Um, and the secret's kind of out. Even the dealers know you see the prices now you go into an antique store and you see a fat boy they're going to have 95 dollars on the price tag or something you know they would never that was never the case i remember finding toggles for like 10 or 15 dollars that's like, wild uh, wow. yeah that's what that's wild yeah I'm, i think it was like a few months ago or at least within the past six months uh is it a bottom dial fat boy like um like showed up on ebay and it like hit over like two grand and i'm just like yeah. ugh, ugh. no yeah, I mean, it's crazy, but I mean, at the same time, there's a fine, if you know the law of economics, there's a finite supply and there's infinite demand. That means price has to rise. Yes, such is the case, especially with the the vintage vintage items. They're just... Well, or you see, I mean, to switch gears real quick, you see stuff that went out of production, like trade array, for instance. Trade arrays were, were, were fetching huge price um and then now shane from blackland has had permission to reproduce the trade array and that's that's quelling some of that demand but before man like two or three years ago if i got a trade array in i could sell them for four or five hundred dollars for wow. a freaking trade array it used to retail for like 150 or 200 dollars. i mean i'm talking about crazy You know, that's another thing I'll, I'll, I'll say that one of my attitudes that I think maybe has contributed to my being able to stay around is that I've tried to play nice in the sandbox with everybody because um, I've seen that people who are newcomers can very quickly become very popular. Uh, people that are uh, old timers can very quickly go away and that you just gotta play nice. I'll give you two, two for instances. Uh, back in the day, Lynn Abrams of Straight Razor Place and, and StraightRazorDesigns.com, Lynn Abrams was the absolute god emperor of straight razors. Well, he held that title for probably 15 years. Now he's off. He's out of the market. He's done. Straight Razor Designs closed up shop, sold off their inventory. Straight Razor Designs is gone. Lynn Abrams, if he is still around, is 
is not anywhere near in the position of authority he was before. Um, someone who's a newcomer, I'll, you know, switch gears. Uh, there's a guy named Dan Varga who's on, on Facebook and he just started doing uh, replating. And you know what? People are like, oh, Matt must feel threatened. I'm like, no, I don't feel threatened at all. Like, welcome, Dan. I hope you have a successful business. I hope you explode in popularity. Or, or when I saw another example uh, two years ago at Maggard's Meetup in Michigan, uh, Yates Precision had a table right next to me. Mm -hmm. And I had Rex on the table. And we were already had been on the market for like a year or two. And he was just coming out with the Yates stuff. Um, and I, I, he was a nice guy. met him. And uh, I, I wished him luck. And now he's doing really well. He's mm -hmm. selling a lot of race. So I see his Instagram. Mm -hmm. So I, I just kind of come to find that play nice, be nice, be respectful, um, mind your manners, so to speak, because you never know who's going to be the next big guy. And you never know if the next big guy is going to, you know, is going to be going away. So just, just be nice to everybody. Oh, what well, you know, one issue too, as we put the call out for questions, um, or just just experiences with you know with Razor Emporium and whatnot is uh, the topic of uh, customer service and you touched upon this earlier Matt too where you know the, the size of your company and kind of what kind of requests come in but uh, the nature of of these um, of the comments were more kind of the uh, kind of prolonged periods uh, uh, of certain certain jobs if Razor were sent in. Uh, the turnaround times or um, maybe just like a, uh, problems with communication or lack thereof. And I just wonder if, if you could talk a little bit, because you, know, you, you've been giving us like a very you know, open uh, behind the scenes look, but um, what are some of the factors, I guess, kind of that might be playing into uh, the, some of these issues? Yeah, well, I appreciate that. And I would love to talk about that. I, I have no shame in this, in this arena. Um, first off, I would just like to say as a blanket statement, um, we would not be in business without our customers. I would not be sitting here enjoying a nice beer and some uh, pub pretzels and cheese and driving a nice truck without our customers. So we are here to serve our customers, number one. Um, number two, addressing you know service times or communication issues or customer service issues. Um, as I kind of stated earlier, Razor Emporium, like any business, is always a work in progress. Um, it's never done. It's never finished. It's never done being you know, growing. You know, when the company started, when I started taking service requests, it was me and my garage and two machines in my garage. And now I have, you know, 7,000 square foot building and eight people and, you know, dozens of machines everywhere and plating tanks everywhere. So it's really grown. It's hard though to, to try to keep up because we have all sorts of kind of customers. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier, my friend uh, owns a leather, a leather company. He makes, you know, wallets and belts and all sorts of stuff. And he always laughs at me like, man, your, your, your Razor customers are just so, um, they need to have their hand held. I'm not saying that to be rude or to, um, to be snarky or snotty. But when you buy a leather belt, there's not a lot of questions about the leather belt you're going to buy. Okay, what kind of leather is it? Where's it made? How's it fit? Great, I like it. Shaving's really unique because everyone has their own story. Everyone has their own skin. Everyone has their own, you know, special concerns. And <laughs> I was mentioning to you earlier, Jonathan, how many requests we get a day. A day. I'd say probably 15 or 20 emails or phone calls per day of people who are not necessarily even buying something, who just want to talk about their, their shaving issues. Hi, my name's Josh, and I'm having irritation. I've tried using this and this and that. Thank you. And um, I'm not seeing any results. What do you recommend? Now someone has to sit there and write an email. And I can't hire, you know, the Philippine uh, lady from customer service to write them an email. It has to be someone who knows about shaving, who has personal experience with shaving, who has the knowledge of all the different razors and all the different products that this person's even referencing to write a, a comprehensible email back to them for them to may not even buy anything from us. We spend a ton of time in customer service. It doesn't even turn into anything because that's what we do. 
on the same token, we have people who come into our store. Yes, we have a storefront. Not You notice not a lot of other people do. Even Douglas from Phoenix Artisan does not have a storefront. West Coast Shaving does not have a storefront. Shave Nation. No, no one else, has, I mean, Maggards, of course, has a beautiful storefront, but a lot of people do not have storefronts because you get customers walking in and they'll take up 30 or 45 minutes of your time. They'll smell everything, they'll look at everything, they'll touch everything, then they walk out. It's really hard. Then we get a customer who actually has already given us money, who already has uh, placed an order for service or whatever, and wants that customer service. And I want to give it to them. Um, and it just comes down to a matter of being stretched thin. And I, I, I fully admit that I probably need to have a, a full-time customer service person who does not do anything other than take care of our customers that are in for service. I'm, I have a, a current technician right now, I was telling Jonathan earlier, who is uh, needing to do some light duty work because of uh, a personal situation. And I'm probably gonna have her do nothing but update customers because, you know, we, someone sends a razor and I get it. We, we try to tell them up front, you know, check this portal, here's a light link. Any, any updates happen on this portal? Well, they don't always check the portal. They'll send us an email instead. They'll send us a, a, a message instead on, on Facebook Messenger, on Instagram, a phone call instead. And they're not checking their portal. And we've already updated their portal. They haven't even seen the update because they're not logging in. And um, so a lot comes down to that. But I'm not trying to make excuses. Um, we're growing. There's always growing pains. Um, you know, what we get in every day is probably what other people get in in a week or a month, you know, we probably get in a dozen razors a day for service. Um, I can tell you that like our straight razor honing is incredibly fast. We can get a honing job out in three or four or five business days. A tune up, light little polish, little sanitation adjustment, three or four or five business days. The jobs that take the longest in our shop are the revamps because we run into so many issues. Let me give you a for instance. I just had a friend, his name's Scott. We worked a deal. He sold me a bunch of fat boys and slims and I had a toggle in my shop. I said, you can have the toggle and trade for all this other stuff. And he's my buddy on Facebook and I love Scott. I'm not going to say his last name, but his name's Scott. He's already messaged me two or three times saying, what's taking so long on my toggle? Well, little does he know that his toggle has been polished, plated, and we've tried to put it together three or four or five different times and we're having some kind of little issue with the mechanics. Well, guess what? We can't spend an eight-hour day working on one razor. If we have an issue, sometimes we put it to the side. We work on other things. We'll come back to it tomorrow. Other thing is fatigue. I know this sounds maybe minuscule. When you're a technician and you have job after job after job, my techs have all these jobs coming their way. If you start getting frustrated with what you're working on, you're going you're gonna to mess it up. And so a lot of times there's a little fatigue sense setting in. My tech will put it to the side. I'm going to work on this tomorrow. I'm burned out. I, I, I'm scratching my head. Or I'm frustrated. This is not going together the right way. They're going to put it to the side. You got to remember, these razors, Gillette never sold service manuals for any of this stuff. They never thought anyone 50 years later was going to take these things apart and try to fix them and put them back together. We've had to make our own tools, invent our own processes. And a lot of times we have to substitute parts, switch parts, modify parts, file down and sand down to get things to work the right way. And so it's it's not a straightforward process. Um, it's not like changing the oil in your car where you, you take out a screw and you drain the oil and you put some oil in and it's done. Okay, uh, Jiffy Lube, I'm done. It seems to take time. It's like jewelry. And um, if we don't take our time and do it the right way, you know, the customer's gonna know they're gonna get the product back and it's not gonna work or it's gonna have scratches and dings and dents and we have to be really careful. So. I know this all sounds like a bunch of excuses, but we're trying We're trying our best to communicate. Uh, please know that if you send us an email or if you send us a message, we try to answer everything as fast as we can. We try to have every razor out the door. Trust me, we take no pride in having a ton of items in the shop. In fact, it's like it like gives me sick, sick to my stomach to look around and see service work backing up. You know, during COVID, we had like 300 razors in the shop and I remember like literally getting sick to my stomach. I, I just, I felt such a, I was like Frodo Baggins uh, at Mount Doom, 
feeling all this weight of the world of all those people stuck in my shop. I, I wanted to get it out. I was so happy that when we finally got up and running, we, we crushed it. We got it all up so fast. But at any given time, there's probably 40, 50, 60 racers in our shop. And they're all different stages. If you have an inquiry, let us know. Generally speaking, it's kind of like the doctor. No news is good news. We're doing something. You'll usually hear from me. In fact, I usually call customers personally. There's a problem. You're going to hear from me. I'll say, hey, we're working on your razor, and this part broke. And I have a substitute part, and it could cost 20 bucks. Are you good with that? Okay, cool. Generally, if there's no news, it's good news. We're working on it. There just happens to be a backlog. Um, if anyone is out there in the Phoenix area and who wants a job working on razors, please hit me up. My email is sales at razoremporium.com. We're hiring because it takes a very specialized person. That's another thing I wanted to touch upon. We've had, you know, it's hard to find someone who can come in and work on razors. And, you know, I've even had professional jewelers. I had a professional jeweler come in one time with 50 years experience, an older guy. And he said, I'm just looking for a part time job. You'd be perfect. Come on in. You're a jeweler. You, you've done it all. He gave up after two days. He said, this is harder than any jewelry I've ever done. I'm not doing this. Not for what you're going to pay. And that's the other thing. People want this level of quality, but they want to pay you know, next to nothing. I'm not trying to you know, demean it, but if you take in your watch for adjustment, you're going to pay you know, $50, $60 for your watch to be worked on. You know, our tune-up is like $29 for a razor, $39 for a razor. You know, it's like what we do for what we charge is such a hard thing. I can't have professional, you know, metal finishers come in who have 50 years experience. They're just not going to do the job where I'm going to pay them. Um, there's not enough meat on the bone. So it's hard to find good, good help. But if you are in the Phoenix area and you want to work on razors all day long, I have a job for you. I don't pay benefits. <laughs> I'll probably pay you 14 or 15 bucks an hour and you're going to work really, really hard. And it's going to be very demanding. Um, even right now, man, I, I personally do all the plating right now in my entire shop. I've been doing the plating for about nine months now. I had a plater before, but he didn't work out. I personally do every single plating. And my, I have two people polishing right now. And before it goes in for, for plating, these pieces have to be pristine. People think the plating is all the magic. The magic is all the polishing work. And so I personally look at every single razor, every single part, and I use a, a Sharpie. And I'll sit there and I'll say, oh, there's a little tiny hairline mark right there. Repolish this. And they get so mad at me. I got to redo this. Yeah, you got to redo that. Um, that's the other thing is like our standards. We try to have really, really high standards. If I wasn't concerned, I would just send out crap. Man, we could get a lot more shit out the door every day. But I have very high standards. I want our customers to be thrilled when they open the box and not have any issues. And so it limits what we can get out. We probably ship home. 40 or 50 razors every single week and we've probably taken 40 or 50 or 60 razors every week so there's always a backlog of stuff in the shop you know we always have something in the shop that's being worked on so i know that's a long-winded explanation uh, just know that i care about our customers I, I i care about the wood shavers if i didn't care i would do something else i'd make widgets um <laughs> you know there's a lot of other things i could do with my time i love this community i love this market i love our customers I want you guys happy. You have a problem, let me know. I try to work everything out. I've taken care of customers that had a year, let's say someone had a razor plated two years ago and there's some little uh, you know, issue, oh, it's not opening right or there's a little spot of, of brass showing now or some, something's going on. I'll take care of you. You send me an email, you send me a picture, I'll take care of our customers. So I, I try to help everyone out. I try to be there forever because I want to be in this market forever. So that's my story. I'm done. Mic drop. Sorry for ranting for 10 minutes. <laughs> you know, I, so I, yeah, I think, you know, the people that, you know, came uh, that told that asked us about that. And, you know, I always say this speaking as a consumer, I, I don't think we realize like how, you know, not tedious, but just like how intense that process is and just, you know, like everything that you guys have to do. And so I think it's something to understand. And, and I would hope that for the most part, people are understanding that, you know, it's not a, it's not something that you can just like do instantly, uh, you know, and get it back in, in a expedited manner. Um, you know, good, you know, quality, quality work takes time and, most people would rather have the good time put in and, and you know, get back their product uh, uh, 
in in a condition that you know they would be very very happy with yeah and and that's you know it's another unique thing you know earlier we talked about customers who have come and gone there's been about four or five other customer vendors who have tried to offer replating services who have come and gone just since i've been around uh, currently i think there's dan varga from razor refresh there's um what's his name out in hawaii scott ferguson what's his company he does he doesn't do the plating he does the uh the paint the coating right on the razors the, the coating huh yeah the coating the color coating on the um, uh yeah the different colors i'm trying to think of what his i'm i'm, I'm totally, i can't believe i'm blanking on his company's name scott ferguson's his name though <laughs> um, but uh there there's there's maybe one or two other like there's this guy razor razor plate you know he's got a day job that's another thing you got to pay the bills with this these other guys have day jobs and they do this as a hobby well, the great that, that's that's awesome, but what happens, you see, is they get backlogged and they don't take work for a while. They say, oh, I got so much work. In the, I'm not taking work for three months. Um, you know, I got I got busy with my, my personal life or my, my job. I'm not taking work. Um, they can't really scale up at all. You know, we've really tried to do that. Um, it's it's a it's a tough market. And I've I've eked by. I'm not perfect. We've made mistakes. Um, I didn't start, I didn't go to school for metal finishing. I went to school for business marketing. You know, I've had to figure this out as we go. Again, Gillette didn't send me like a service manual book for every razor of how to adjust it and fix it. And like, that's another unique thing we do. Like we call it the razor revamp because, you know, not only does it come back looking beautiful, it's functional again. Um, I've had to custom make parts. No other vendor has done this. Like we custom make replacement end caps for the Gillette razors. No one else has done that. I had to order 10,000 end caps to be made just to get them to be done because there was no other vendor who would do it for less quantity. Plus, well, it's going to take me a long time to sell 10,000 end caps. Wow. Um, the little clicker, it goes from the fat boy and the slim that makes it go click, 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 click. Yeah, I had to make like 5,000 of those from some vendor in China because we kept on having issues with customers sending them in. They were broken. They would say, well, they're broken. What am I supposed to do? And I'd say, I don't know. Well, finally, I, I had to fork over thousands of dollars to have you know, a bunch of these made up so we could put them as replacement parts. Um, we're the only ones doing that. No one else is stupid enough to take on doing that, I think. Um, so there, there's, kind of, there's, there's a lot behind the scenes that happens. I don't think people understand. I have talked to my video person, Marissa, and I have told her, um, you know, we really got to show a step-by-step, -step, kind of like one of those uh, ASMR YouTube videos where someone takes apart like an old matchbox, you know, truck or old Tonka truck and completely restores it. We need to do something where we just show everyone every single step. The problem is now it shows all my competition how we do it. Because mm. uh, there's a lot of secret things we do. A lot of, a lot of, I mean, I have all my employees sign on disclosure agreements because I have a lot of tools that I've literally custom fabricated, custom made to do things and I, I don't always want to give that away of how I do stuff. It's like a magician, right? But customers need to know how much is involved. So we want to find a compromise where we can show customers a lot of what we do. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that um, when we had Big Shave Southwest here in 2019, the owner of Carve, which I'm blanking on his name right now, um, he came down. Huh? Chris? Yeah, Chris. 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 Chris came to my shop. And Chris was absolutely blown away. This is my old shop too, which was nowhere near as impressive looking as my new one. He couldn't believe how much was involved. I showed him all the, all the really long tour of all the secrets. He couldn't believe it. He said, I don't think anyone has any idea how, you know, how involved this is. Um, so if it was easy, everyone else would be doing it. Let's just say that. It'd be a lot easier if I just made soaps. I can tell you, we, we make, thousands of soap a month and it's like child's play compared to the restoration stuff um in fact if i didn't care about this community i'd give up the restoration and just and just manufacture rex razors and, and manufacture soap because both are far easier than the restoration i do the restoration because i care and because it breaks my heart to see these beautiful old razors that are in poor condition i i, I just i can't help myself I, I want them to look better uh really quick North Shore. Yes, uh, <laughs> North Shore razors, of course. Yeah. I looked it up, so I, I, I don't want to just interrupt you in the middle of it. So, all right, yeah. so North, North Shore. Thanks for looking that up. 
And also, I'm Scott, sorry, go ahead. George. Shout out to Scott. Uh, <laughs> Scott uh, shout out to Scott Ferguson. Oh, Facebook. he's a great guy. We've swapped tips back and forth. Like, oh, how do you do this? How do you do that? He's, a, he's an awesome guy. He does quality work. What are some things that maybe you haven't mentioned or you want to go into more detail on as far as what, as far as what's coming up for you for Razor Emporium, for Rex Supply? Well, for Rex, Rex, uh, the, the, probably the closest thing that's coming out next is going to be a stand for our new brush. We have a brush that's been on the market for just a couple of months called the Deco Brush. It's really cool looking, all angular geometry. Um, for the for the metal handle, um, there's a new stand coming out. In terms of razors, um, they have two razors in the works that I keep on playing with and trying to perfect the way it shade. And another question I constantly get: I've had people ask me with the ambassador, with the envoy, they'll say, "Is the blade exposure positive or negative?" We just had this this question last week, and I I told the person I said I don't even know. I know it sounds horrible. I don't know because I don't, I don't, I don't like design this in a program and then shave with it. I do the opposite. I start somewhere and then I tell my machinist to change this. It's not shaving. And he now knows a lingo. He knows if I say I wanted to shave more aggressive, he needs to increase the blade gap or increase the width of the guard or whatever. So he'll give me like five guards and he'll say, tell me which you will just put a number on it. Like one, two, three, four, five. He'll say, which one do you like more? Okay. I like this one. I like number three. And then we'll keep on, we'll, we'll go on this for months. Oh, I don't, well, three is really good, but I want like a couple of variations of three, like three A, three B, three C. And we'll have like variations of that. And I just do it by feel. I keep on shaving with it. I'm like, yeah, no, this is really good. And that's how, that's how the razors come around. I don't do it like in some program where we're like mapping it out or copying other razors. I just, I just go into, I love it and I can't put it down. That, then I'm like, okay, it's done. That's the razor. Um, so there's two razors I keep on playing with right now. One's going to be very friendly on your budget. One's not going to be friendly at all. One's going to be the, the one the wife doesn't want to hear about. <laughs> um, the one that is going to be friendly on your budget is going to be my first dive into aluminum. Um, you know, I always talk about Gillette. Gillette's my biggest inspiration. For instance, the year is 1957. You could go to a department store. You could buy the Tech Razor for 69 cents, the Super Speed for $1, the Fat Boy for $1.95, the Aristocrat for $3.49, the President for $5, and the Toggle for $10. So it didn't matter if you had 69 cents in your pocket or $10, there was a razor for your price point. In the same regard, I want Rex to be that way. We have the Ambassador 249. We have the Envoy 125. I want to have a razor at around $75, $85, you know, roughly half of the Envoy because I want to have mass appeal. It's my tech razor. It will not be based off a tech razor. It will be based off another razor in history that for some reason no one has thought to clone. Um, it is going to be more or less a clone. It will have some slight modifications to it, but it's another famous razor, not Gillette in history. I will not say anything more. That um, that's very unique, and um, it'll be a budget-friendly aluminum razor. This is actually going to cause me to have to set up even more infrastructure in my shop because I'm going to do the anodizing myself. Um, anodizing requires a lot more equipment, a lot more tanks, a lot more chemistry. I have the space. We're setting it up as we speak right now uh, because I do not want to send out anodizing to another shop offsite. Um, this exact same problem just happened with Above the Tie. Above the Tie had to send their aluminum razor to China to be manufactured and anodized because they could not find an American company that could do it right, I guess, to their standards or whatever. Uh, I don't know how hard they look, but that was just what they told us. I want to have that in-house. So we're going to make an aluminum razor and we're going to anodize it in-house. It's going to retail for like 75 or 85 bucks. It's going to shave like a dream. It's going to be very easy, a very nice shaving razor for 75 or $85. Then we have another razor that's going to be another adjustable. Again, I don't want to give away too much. It'll be different than the ambassador, but it'll be 
in the same vein, it'll have an adjustment dial and it will adjust, but it'll be a little bit different configuration of the guard. And uh, that's going to be more like probably 349. Um, and I don't expect to sell anywhere near as many of them, but I want to make it because no one else has done it. Um, you know, that's kind of my big thing for me is I like to have a challenge. I like to be the first at doing something. I, I maybe you call it ego. I, I, I don't watch sports. I don't have any lick of competitiveness when it comes to that kind of stuff. But in business, I like to be really competitive and uh, I want to do something that no one else has done before. So that's what's new from Rex. For Razor Emporium, we have a new website that's going to be launching. In fact, I'm supposed to see a preview of it this week. A new skin for our website, uh, more intuitive, more mobile friendly. Um, and there is a massive, massive thing I've been working on for five years that I hope can come out this year. It's going to allow people to identify razors um, easier than ever before to answer the age old question of what razor do I have? What razor did I find? If you're at the antique store, I'm trying to make a tool right now that will help people identify any razor ever made. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> um, uh, also, on a smaller scale, we, we're going to be doing some body soaps and other personal care uh, razor, or, or shaving, sorry, shaving soap scents. The same scents we have for shaving soaps, lavender, sandalwood, old school, barbershop, citrus, we're going to have available in uh, body soaps and um maybe some facial soaps and other things. So kind of expanding that market because like I said, it's child's play compared to doing metal restoration. So I'm like, oh, let's do it. People really like it. Why not? That's all. That's, that's what's new with Razor Emporium, I guess. <laughs> you, you say that as if like, these are small things <laughs> that are on the, on the horizon. But uh, I mean, that, that's very exciting, especially, um, you know, as for, for the the rec side for the razor releases to yeah. kind of hit something that's like uh, you know budget friendly, easy on your wallet, and then yeah. for like the hyper enthusiast, if you want to say right, like you got something. It'll for be them. the hyper enthusiast. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, uh, we'll definitely keep our eye out um, for for announcements on all those things and. Uh, and, and Matt, just for our listeners, the best place, I mean, you know, off the top of my head, you have your YouTube channel, uh, Razor Emporium, uh, all your socials, right? Instagram, Facebook, all that good stuff. Where else, where else should they, they be looking? You named it. Um, everyone knows me from YouTube, apparently. Uh, I'm still amazed by how many people don't know about my other channel that we did years ago, the I'd Lather Be Shaving Show. I, I still talk to customers and, and they, let, they love my regular YouTube and I, I say, oh, you like the I'd rather be shaving? What's that? <laughs> so if you didn't know about I'd rather be shaving, it's a whole other channel. It's a much more comical, lighthearted um, look at the shaving world and we talk about all sorts of topics. I did that with an, another friend, Douglas from Phoenix Artists and Accoutrements. Um, fond memories of making that show. I was hoping you were going to touch upon that because I'd love to, to dish on that for a minute. But <laughs> no, let's uh, let let's do it. You know, uh, again, I, look, I look how much beer I have left. I have so much beer. Yeah, now, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now you've got me nice and lubricated. I'm ready to spill the beans. <laughs> All right, well, let, let's do. Let, let's uh, let's backtrack then. I know I was trying to wind things down. Just be mindful of your time. But I personally, because I have watched uh, that program, that channel. I, I, I actually forgot it's totally on its own channel, not on one of e yours or Douglas's, but. Uh, now, correct me if I'm wrong. You were playing the straight man in that in that duo, and that the idea is like it's a morning show for shaving enthusiasts. <laughs> so, so the whole idea of the show started when we had our grand opening for our old building. That must have been in 2016 or 2017. We opened another building, and um, he came to it. I asked him to come. And we had a big barbecue, and had customers out there. And he was sitting there looking at my display case, all my razors I had at the time. And he said, we should do a, a YouTube video where we talk about the history of one razor at a time. And you and I can kind of riff about it. You know, we talk about super speeds and fat boys and whatever else. And um, he originally wanted to call the show like something so stupid. It was like shaving time 2000. 
It was just like and he wanted it to be like an off, just an off the ball kind of goofy name that no one would remember. And I said, "That's stupid, Doug." And I said, "Why don't we think of something more catchy that's kind of like a pun?" That's where your business marketing mind came in. You're like, "No, no, that's that's not good." Well, and I don't want to like you know his soaps are also named just weird names that have nothing to do with like. That's why when I made my soaps, I thought I called my citrus soap citrus. <laughs> like, I'm not gonna call it like Astro Planeta. Like I don't know. He's got all this cheap. You know, I, I, I you know, Doug. I'll say this: He is a brilliant idea man. He is a brilliant promoter. Um, I give him all the credit in the world. He knows how to do that, and he does it better than I think a lot of people. But he's also he's he's an artist, and the, you know what I mean by an artist? He's an artist. Yes. Um, so that was the impetus of the show. Yeah, he was more the goofball. I was kind of more the straight guy. I mean, at the same time, I was trying to be myself. But I also yeah. didn't want to like tarnish my reputation for Razor Emporium by doing this and like be a complete asshole or something and <laughs> totally too crazy. So yeah, there were episodes like the Germany episode and I chugged like a, a huge beer like this and like, yeah, I got drunk on set, had some fun, you know. Um, other thing to note about that show, mm -hmm. speaking of getting drunk on set, was that we would, sh the only way it was economically viable, meaning financially viable to shoot that was if we shot four or five a day. So we had the crew out yeah. and we had to have all of the scripts, all the props, all the costumes, all the outfits for five shows. But we'd start at eight o'clock in the morning. We'd finish at five o'clock at night. They were long days. And so, yeah, like sometimes by episode three or four, there was not coffee in my drink. That was just, you know, whiskey I'm sipping on because I'm like, <laughs> fuck, man. <laughs> This is hard and trying to remember all this stuff like we didn't have like a teleprompter you know we had like a little script we kind of re we'd, we review it in between uh takes and stuff okay we're going to talk about the ship repeating razor okay it came out in 1926 by colonel mm -hmm. dick and chick or whatever and we we're like sitting there trying to cram like before final we're cramming information and trying to regurgitate it organically yeah and Douglas used to get so pissed because he would have notes and he would constantly want to look down at his notes. And then when he wanted the camera to like be on me while he was talking, and I'm like, dude, if you're talking, the camera's on you, man. You got to know this shit. So we had some creative differences. That's one reason the show stopped. We, we made three seasons. There was the same crew for season one and two. We had a new crew for season three. And it kind of came to a halt because of COVID, yeah. But um more than anything, and I, I have no problem saying this, I love Doug. He's a great guy. I would love to do the show with him again under the right circumstances. But towards the end, he didn't want so much structure. He kind of wanted it to be a free-for-all, like a, like a jam session, so to speak, where we'd kind of just, just riff on, on a razor or riff on a concept for 10 or 15 minutes. And I'm like, dude, I'm paying a couple hundred dollars per episode. I don't really want to just ad lib the whole thing. I kind of want to have a structure here. And he also didn't like the, the games and the competition, you know, the activity, whatever it was for yeah. the episodes. He didn't want to do that anymore. Cause he kept on having like, I guess, ego issues or whatever with me. And he, he's like, let's not do that. Let's just talk. And that's the end of the episode. And I was like, no, like, that's the whole point. That's like the payoff for the, for the viewers. They get to watch this fun thing at the end. So um, we had some creative differences. There was never any fighting or anything. I would, again, I would love to do the show with them again, but um, it just took a lot of time, you know, took a lot of money. Like each episode cost each of us a couple hundred dollars a piece. And man. the return wasn't always there where I was like, hey man, you want to do an episode of the Stolly vibrating razor from the 1930s? I don't even sell those, right? I sell one a year. Like, I just... It's not what I want to spend my marketing money on. I'd rather make my own YouTube video on a product I do sell or make a, a, a product review video or something that's more relevant. So it just started becoming in like, I, I felt like we were grabbing at straws of what we were going to do and scraping the bottom of the barrel of ideas. Um, again, under the right circumstances, sure, mm -hmm. I'd do it again with them. It was so much fun. I think the, the, the most fun episode we ever did was that antiquing one when we went out to... Uh, globe in miami arizona we went out antiquing 
and um, people got to see some of that picking. And when I found that toggle razor out there, that was all real. That was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, fun memories. Yeah. Sorry, you guys. Uh, hey, I th- if anything else, I hope people see today that I'm a normal guy. I'm, I'm just I'm a wet shaver who kind of just stuck with it and kept on going. I'm not. I didn't come into this as some business investor like, hey, this is a market I can make money and like. I just am a normal guy out there. I like to shave and like to wet shave, and I want to make great stuff and do great things for people, you know, and help help this market grow. To me. Uh, the thing I'm most honored about is that I've watched this market grow up and expand. And there's people like you guys out there, there's artisans, there's people doing things, making things, uh, getting and getting better shades. At the end of the day, it still gets me every time when someone writes to us an email or a phone call or a customer comes in and says, man, you know, I was getting really bad irritation and I got a double edge razor or I got whatever straight razor and man, I have all the confidence in the world now, or I look better or my wife looks me better. or I look better in my job. Or I look better in a suit and tie, whatever it is. Like, I think it's badass. Cause I know for me, when I had my corporate job and I would wear a collar all day long and I had bad neck irritation, it really affected my self-confidence. Like it made me feel um, uh, inadequate or made me feel like I didn't know what I was doing. And for people out there that can find a better solution and they can feel better about themselves, like that's what that's what we do this for, right? Well, Matt, thank you so much for joining us for t- uh, today's Lather Talk episode. Uh, you you know the, you have had such great unique insight because of how long you've been in this, uh, both on the hobbyist end um, and as a vendor all that good stuff. So I do want to thank you. you know, thank you for sharing your stories with us. Thank you for uh, you know, addressing stuff directly from our listeners. And uh, we hope, you know, just more success to you and really looking forward to what you have coming out real soon. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. I always love talking to the white shaving community and uh, I'm honored that people enjoy what we do and are supporting us. And we hope to continue to serve this community and with new products and new services and um, and fun. That's why we all do this, right? It's for fun. You know, any, anytime I talk to a customer and they say, why do I wet shave? You want to have more fun. You don't want to just sit there and drag a cartridge across your face for electric razor. You want to have some fun. And I'm, I'm happy to be a part of that. So thank you so much for having me. Well, guys, thank you so much for joining us for this episode of Lather Talk. We had so much fun talking to Matt this past week. You can find all the links and socials for Gerard and myself in the show notes. Also, don't forget you can join the conversation on the Lather Talk Discord server. It's a great place to hang out and chat with your fellow wet shavers and listeners of the podcast. If you guys enjoyed the episode this past week, you can lend us a hand by leaving us a five-star review if you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts. And if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you hit that like button and subscribe if you haven't done so already. We hope you enjoy the show and that you'll join us for the next episode.